producer, Nikos Karavigias. It's from the producer, Jermaine Johnson.
So, so you know, whenever I, I uh, conversations that I have with, with actors, I always say like, what's your point of connection? Like, what's your, what informed your approach? But, but generally, I'm, I'm watching the film, and again, you know, with all the, with, with just your work, and certainly uh, all the interviews that I read with you for this movie, like, you must have, like, read the screenplay and just went, God, this, this, this is getting this out of, like, everything. It informed my approach to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much just frustrating and shut off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call my agent back. <laughs> Get me in there. Um, well, we, we Cord and, and Percival Everett, who wrote the, the novel, uh, Erasure, I think a talk a few weeks ago, and Percival said that he doesn't write all biographical pieces, but there's a lot of him in this book and this character, and likewise, you heard from Cord as well, the overlap that he experienced through reading the book. And for me, oh, Cord, Cord sent me the, the uh, script by an email, and uh, he attached a really wonderful letter describing that and saying that he had, you know, thought of me uh, you know, uh, very early on in the process of, of considering writing this script. Uh, he, he, he says as well that it, it took me a while to get back to him. <laughs> Um, and the reason for that was because I was living a very monk-like existence at that time in that my, my mother passed away about a year before I got the script. Had the great good fortune of being raised by two women, my mother and, um, and her eldest sister, my, uh, my aunt Naomi, uh, who immediately came up to live with us uh, when my mother was ailing. I'm, I'm an only child. Monk wants to be an only child. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, it was a heavy burden on me. My mother went uh, very quickly, um, kind of shockingly quick, uh, from cancer, and I was, you know, there for that final, uh, for her final uh, phase. And then my aunt and, uh, and I had kids, and the pandemic set in, and it was like the walls were crushing in. So I understood very, uh, from an intimate level, what that implies for one's existence uh, and you know, the sacrifices that you are asked to make, you know, whether they be professional or creative, or, you know, particularly personal. Um, so I was drawn into that side of the film particularly. And but the first scene of the of the movie was one I couldn't I couldn't wait to play. Oh, oh my God, because that I think what's wonderful about this film is that you know we're a small film we shot in 26 days uh the budget was the uh, breakfast burrito budget for the batman film that I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for the ideas the ideas are right within this film the ideas are timely and they're big ideas that we're all considering that are at the forefront particularly of the political conversation right now race identity inclusion how do, we, how do we solve this? Some are saying, how do we make it disappear? But we're all thinking about it, but we don't often talk about it together. Well, that's not a necessarily very productive conversation at the beginning of the film, but it's managed well. It's managed with a fluency, and that's not in the book. It's managed with a fluency by a chord that I found really exciting and really rare. And so uh, it's a conversation that I've had with myself and with friends, and so I look around at you know the way our you know our understanding of race and our ability to kind of problem problem solve around race seems to be deteriorating. I was I, I was super excited from that first scene to jump in, and uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, so I was I was caught with you know on both sides of my mouth by a two pronged hook, uh, one on the satirical side and the other on the family side. Uh, I just want to say again, twenty six days. That is like incredible. 25, really. Yeah, the, 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 the final day was after a few cuts of the film had been, uh, had been completed. All right, so so this screenplay is, you know, all the all the reviews that I read about the film, I mean, like, there aren't enough adjectives to describe just how perfect the screenplay is, razor sharp, uh, 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 you name it. So with a screenplay like that, he does, like getting, yeah, we're gonna have to share with Mike's. Uh, oh, sorry. With a screenplay like that, it must have been for you guys, Jermaine, to get a distributor. It must have been like, oh my God, like, you cannot wait to make this movie, right? I mean, 
Well, I mean, we start close to the beginning of the screenplay, probably. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's that's the fun part. You know, I've been working with Corey for a decade or so now, and and when he gets excited to write something, I get excited to read something. So it's pretty fantastic. And when he picked up the book, like he said, he thought it was written for him, and and the script poured out of him, and. And very quickly, I was very, I was like, okay, I, I see what this can be, and I said, we're gonna put fuck on the title page. And he says, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's where we're gonna send it out. He goes, what if it's people? I go, yeah, yeah, let's scare people. Because I knew we had just an incredible piece of writing, and the thing is, you got to charm from the very beginning. And I think that is something that, you know, when we ended up getting in a room with Ben and T Street and Nikos and those guys, I think one of the first things I've said is this this is a little uncomfortable and when we feel something uncomfortable we run towards it. Yeah. And I think we immediately knew we had the right partners. They, you know, once they said that and once they said we're gonna finance the movie. Because <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, so we have a partnership with MRC at T Street that allows us to kind of green light movie to a certain budget level. Awesome. But we access a little bit more money when Mr. Wright here agreed to get involved. So a little bit more. A little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> a little bit more. Budget, so. But but it definitely helped us access a little more resources. Um, but the script seems clear. That the personal nature of the story that we're talking about was clear on the page from the beginning. It was the script that had to carry us through this entire thing. Um, and uh, but the script is kind of just a roadmap, right? You, you know, there's so many things you don't know when you go to actually make the movie, but yeah. what we believed about Corin, in addition to the fact that it's so personal to him, is that he's an incredible communicator, and that's something that's just sort of being born in Corin, that like, it's a talent that you just can't teach. And so, we told him he didn't ever direct anything before. We told him his job was you know, just to decide. He's got the movie in his head, and he just needs to decide what is the movie and what isn't the movie. And everybody around is going to come in with suggestions for how to make the movie. And say, is this the movie? Is this the movie? You know, well, that's not the movie, but this is the movie. Sure. And just guide it. You know, support him with people uh, like Laura Cartman here, who you know, know their craft at such a deep level. Yeah, we like the way that we we have partners that, that um, never made any of us, you know, none of us know nearly as much about the craft of music, the art form of music as Laura, but she never made us feel inadequate or like we you know, didn't know what we were talking about, we'd give suggestions. She would, she'd like, look, just tell, tell me how it makes you feel and how you want it to make you feel. And I can figure out the technical, you know, requirements to get it there, you know. Okay, so, so Laura, when you were, when you started to really like wrap your head around American fiction, what was the first scene that you approached to score? And then how did that snowball to inform your approach to score the rest of the movie? Um, well, let me, I'm going to answer that, and it's going to be a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> but Nikos just said something that is so important. And that is, I think with all of the crafts, whether it be music or cinematography, the best way to communicate is just through character motivation. Like, what does the film need? I don't need somebody to say, oh, it needs to be in, you know, C major with a, you know, with a raised four or whatever. And that's a mistake, right? Because sometimes when people think they know something about music, they might not have the expertise that they think they have. And so it's easy to misinterpret. So, Court was in fact a, a perfect director because he understood his characters, he understood stood what he had written, he understood the performances that he got, and he understood what music needed to be. Okay, so that just falls out. Now, first scene. <laughs> um, okay, first scene was Jeffrey looking over the ocean. And basically, um, I had written, uh, we had talked about using the music of the Polonius Monk for obvious reasons. Um, and so what I had done was render that scene in two or three versions. I think I did three, but actually I can't remember what the third is. But I know I did a uh, monk, Ruby My Dear, and then I did the monk theme. And I wrote the monk theme to be something that could be quirky, or something that could be uh, funny, or sarcastic, and also very emotional, and ultimately a love theme as well. 
So I wanted to test it out over that scene. And so when they came to hear music for the first time, I played them a number of different uh, versions of what music could work in that scene. And, and um, I remember Ben at the time said, boy, you really, you know, you took it on because it was um, a one place where they had had a test for that they liked quite a lot. And so it was kind of like, you know, I figured, okay, if, if I can get through this one, then I'll be all right the rest of the film. So uh, I would love to hear that once Jeffrey was like in into it, how the rest of the casting process like, how did that like kick off? Who was next? Uh, yeah, you know, once the email that Jeffrey was alluding to that I sent him uh, said, it, it said very openly, I didn't remember writing this, but it said, I have no plan B if you say no. <laughs> <laughs> Which will show you how good of a negotiator I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say, leave with desperation, that's my teacher business school. I talk. <laughs> uh, but so once we got Jeffrey, because like literally, I, before I even sat down to write the script, I was reading the novel in Jeffrey's voice. I don't even remember thinking about like just Jeffrey Wright. I think he just had an organic for it. He was just like, this is Jeffrey Wright, this is Jeffrey Wright. Um, and so once we, you know, that's dangerous to fall in love with an idea like that because he could say no, and then I'd be deeply crestfallen. Yeah. And so it, it's dangerous to have my voice in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> And so when he said yes, it was like, Ray, that never happens. Your first choice is like the first, it basically wrote the script for Jeffrey. And it doesn't happen that always where somebody's like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Like, especially for a first time filmmaker, somebody's never, you know, this was, it was a huge hit. And so I assumed that all the rest of the people, I was like, well, we're gonna have to sort of like, be satisfied with our like six and seven choices after this because we got like number one. And then it was like Sterling K. Brown said yes. Lisa Ray said yes. Leslie Evans is in. John Ortiz is in. Eric Alexander's in. It was like, wait a minute, what? Like it was just all of a sudden we had this embarrassment of riches with the, with the cast. And the thing that, you know, people ask me like, how did you, how did you get this incredible ensemble? How did you get this? level of talent in the first film. And the thing that I tell everybody is, look what happens when you write real roles for black people. And look what happens. Look at, look at, look at the embarrassment of riches that you get. Because this, this was a movie where, you know, I didn't want to just do, you know, I didn't want to just do something where it's like, a character comes out and says some exposition and they like either dis disappear or kill, you know, like that, that happens. We talk often about how black actors are underutilized and they're not, you know, sort of like given um, accolades when they are utilized. And it's like, this is, I, you know, Sterling told me that he had intended on not working for like six months. And then he, was, and then he read the script on the plane, he was on a long flight with his wife. And he read the script and he was like, well, I guess I'm working again. You know, but this is, uh, I wasn't intending, but, but I have to do this. And, you know, that, Eric Alexander said it like as soon as she read it, like it just these people were very, very motivated to, to play real people, lived in characters with real sort of like story arcs. You know, that, that is that was important to them. And, and to me, I just feel incredibly uh, flattered and honored and, and and very, very lucky to get the actors I got. You guys you guys were skipping over a base, so um, you know, I did sign on. And I, I think we've made, uh, we've made a good film. It's a film that we're all proud of. It's a film that's found an audience. It's a film that seems to uh, have a story that seems uh, that, uh, that wanted to be told and seems it uh, wanted to be heard. But it, you skipped over the phase where no one, no one wanted to make this movie. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, that is true. So, so there was, uh, there was, a, there was a time after Jeffrey had signed on, we had the script, and we sent it out to every distributor in town. And we had like 15 meetings with 
all the streamers, all the big studios, everybody that you could probably name right now. And it was the most effusive praise I've ever heard on anything that I've ever worked on. Like, per personally, the most effusive praise I've ever had on a script I've written. And we'd go into these meetings, and people would be like, oh, my, this is, I haven't read a script this good in years. Oh my god, this is one of the best scripts I've ever read. Oh my god, you got Jeffrey Wright attached. She's incredible. Oh, this is amazing. I can't wait to talk to you about it. And we'd go and have these long meetings, and people would be so excited. And it was like, great. Uh, can you give us money for it? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that much. Good luck out there, though. It's great. Um, and, the, and the people saying this, mind you, are regularly making $200 million. Dollars. Regularly. Not like, not once every 10 years. Multiple times a year they're making 150 to 200 million dollars. A movie costs significantly less than $10 million. Dollars. You could make 20 of our movies. <laughs> Truly, you could make 20, you could make 30 of our movies for, for the budget of some of these other movies. And so, we very, very fortunately, you know, we found a real believer in the film, and this woman, Alana Mayo, mm -hmm. who's uh, the head of our art history. Alana's a black woman. She's one of the few black women in this industry who can realize something and say, like, I'm going to do that. And she took a risk. She took a risk. And the thing is, is that, like, you know, it's not even that big of a risk. No. It's so crazy to me in this industry that, like, a sub $10 million risk is more is, is less acceptable than a $150 million risk. It's so weird to me that this industry is so full of money and, and so lacking in courage. You think of the money would give them courage, but it doesn't. It makes them fearful, which is crazy to me. Yeah, it's very weird, but but Jeffrey says, well, that is true, we did, we did. And so there's a world in which without Alana, there's a world in which this movie doesn't exist because 95% of the people we took it to said no. It's the causation piece. Yeah. yeah. Correl look, she's a black woman. Correlation is not equal causation. I'm sorry, causation is not. Wait, correlation does not equal causation. And so I'm not saying that because she's a black woman, she's willing to take a risk. But, you know. It didn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, hang on a second. So, all those people who said no, okay, so then the movie opens, you know, over these last like, six, seven months, and, and they found an audience, the audience found it. Here we are with five Oscar nominations. Uh, did any of those people who said no come back to you and go, like, you know, I'm sorry, I should have said yes? Uh, no, but they're all asking to have meetings with me now. That's right. They knew it would be this. There was one very sheepish woman at the bath. Oh, really? Weeks ago, yeah. Because she was like, I don't even know how to do so. And I was like, I don't know. And she was just yeah, yeah, yelling around Zoom. And I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I wasn't hearing that this movie cost sub 10. But if you watch the film, not knowing that, you think it costs like probably. Wait, can I, I say that? Can I say something? One yeah. last thing? Yeah. Uh, I talk about this. I talk about this a lot at these kinds of things, and, and I think that it, I, I worry sometimes that it sounds vindictive, and I don't want it to be vindictive. I'm actually not a vindictive person anymore. I used to be very vindictive. <laughs> <laughs> I work very hard to not be vindictive anymore, and, and, and so I, it's very important to me to talk about this though because look, I think I'm wonderful. I do. I think all these people are wonderful, but we are not unique. Right? The reason I talk about this so much is because there are so many people out there like me who are wonderful writers, who are wonderful artists, who never get a chance because this industry is terrified of taking a risk. And it's crazy to me. The problem, we always, there's a lot of lip service paid to like, let's bring in marginalized voices. We gotta bring unrepresented voices and it's like, by definition, bringing in a marginalized voice requires a risk. The reason they are marginalized is because they haven't been given an opportunity 
to express themselves, really show you what they can do. And so, in order to bring in marginalized voices in a real way, you have to take a risk. And so, it's, when I talk about this shit, it's, it's not vindictive, it's a plea. It's a more a plea to know that there are so many other people out there like me, truly, who are not being given an opportunity so they can spend $200 million on some other, you know, on some other guy's movie. Disney that's, all, that's all, so I want to make sure that it's not, it's not vindictive, it's a plea. But it also is uh, an ability or a willingness to recognize value and recognize potential. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some blind spots out there for many people. Uh, you know, we are here, uh, and our film has found an audience, we've been recognized. That doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's not solely a function of the quality of the work. We all go out and we try to do good work, you know, over the course of our careers. Uh, the difference this time is that, for me anyway, uh, is that we ultimately got incredible support That's right. from Orion, Amazon, MGM, and that means bluntly resources, finances, uh, energy, time uh, to make sure that our film did find an audience to make sure that the film uh, was put in a position where it might be recognized. The reason that I add this uh, uh, chord to, to what you're saying is because this has never happened before in my career for a film that I was so central to. And people say, oh, you know, uh, you know, like my aunt said, you know, I call my aunt, and she's 94 years old. You know, and she, had, she has trouble uh, seeing now, uh, so she, doesn't dial a phone so easily. So I called her in the morning of the Oscar nominations, and I was like, uh, hey, did you uh, hear any news this morning, Dad? <laughs> and uh, she said, yeah, 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 I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been nominated a long time ago. And, and there's an element, there's a learning curve. 
right? There's going to be a whole journey that I'm on where I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. And, and if you have not signed up to be a substitute teacher, in, you know, in addition to doing your day-to-day -day job, then maybe this isn't the one for you, and I don't regret you that, but like, I, I'm going to need that kind of help. Because on top of me being a first-time director, we don't have a ton of money. So it, 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 that was, I think, one of the biggest things we could do, is really being intentional about that. And I will say, like, I, you know, Migos and the team at T Street really had a, a really great list of people that they could bring in and work with that, that you know, on this shoestring of a budget, was able to come in and say, we see this vision, we believe in this material, we believe in our cast, we believe in Jeffrey, we believe in this team, and we, we want to, you know, kind of grab our teeth and, and, and kind of spit and duct tape and figure out how to pull this thing off. And, you know, I'll, I'll let Nico throw in some thoughts on the on the spit and where the duct tape goes. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of it to start. Yeah, I and mean, I think that the HIV that we found, right, had experience at those budget levels. And part of the expertise there is them knowing where they really need the resources and where they can get by without so many resources. And, and us having an honest enough relationship with them that they can be real with us about you know what you really need to make to pull this off and what can, where can you get away with less. I mean, there are certain things. The Harvard Club, where the, where the climax of the movie takes place, that's a real location. It costs real money, and you have to do a lot of resources to renting that place, to lighting that place. There was a helium shortage at the time. We learned about the helium market on this movie. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you would think it would be easy. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny little, you know, atom, right? Helium. It's, a, it's their hard to find. That cost real money. And then, you know, but in situ, in the beach community of situ, we got a lot of support from that town. Uh, one of our producers who's not here tonight, Ben LeClaire, he, he's from that town. And in fact, uh, the house the Ellison family, uh, you know, owns on the beach there is his childhood art teacher's house from high school. So the family was really into the idea that the hometown heroes could come and shoot the movie there. And we got a lot of value out of that location. Coraline's house is actually just right across the street. So in a, in a movie where we were having to move the base camp generally every couple of days, um, we got to park there for, you know, a week or so and kind of settled into that location. We shot a lot of the different parts of the movie at that location. And I think those parts of the movie are some of the, some of the most like lived in, you know, because we weren't, we didn't have to, you know, sometimes we were kind of on the run, you know, and we, we, we got what we got, and, you know, I credit our editor a lot of with kind of helping shape uh, Hilda Rasula, who's fantastic, who you know. Jonathan Guggenheim, our production designer, he's an incredible Beautiful work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so really it's just about that institutional knowledge of these jobs and you know how you do them the best you can with the limited resources that you have. And you're very resourceful with the limited resources, which is why it does look like it's ten times what it was. Hey, I'm not, I promise I'll get okay, yeah. I, I, I appreciate you, brother. I will I will yeah. I'll get sure. Okay. Jonathan's work with I I found particularly useful for me because as you described that setting being lived in, I found that you know with the uh, with the home, uh, the Ellison home, not just that one, but he had there was a texture to it, and a tone to it, and a personality to it that was local, uh, particularly with the art that he found. A lot of local artists, uh, black, artists. local black art. I mean, there was just the century. there was and, and contemporary and, and 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 not, but there was a it, it just it was so much information that I got just from the walls as he had, as he had used them. In fact, a friend of mine who uh, used to be a curator at the Whitney, uh, who runs the, uh, uh, the studio museum in, Har in Harlem, she was really, really uh, loving what he did. Thelma Gold? Thelma. Yeah. 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 yeah, Thelma just loved, loved the pieces that he had chosen. Yeah. I will say also a little fun little tidbit lacrosse sticks are in Mont's childhood bedroom because <laughs> our friend Jeffrey right here was a big lacrosse guy. <laughs> he's a huge lax player at a, at a where, where'd you, where'd you say? At Amherst. At Amherst, and yeah. In, in fact, All his lax bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, fellow went to Smith. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's yeah, she used to come to the games. <laughs> 
I'll tell you a really embarrassing uh, nickname that she had for me. So uh, Amherst was named after Lord Jeffrey Amherst, who's not a great guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was a smallpox blanket to an Indian's guy. Oh, oh my God. God. But it's, that's the town's name. The college is named after the town. But uh, in, in a subversive attempt to erase him, uh, she would come to the game, she would call me Lord Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought was, I thought that was relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. So in that in that scene of Mark walking out in the ocean was the first scene that you that, that was your entry point into the film. But then the rest of the score is is so fundamentally different, at least to to one point of the ear for the first time. So like what was the second scene like and how did you sort of find the themes, like Monk's theme, the family theme? Uh, and so, so you felt that you got it down because there's a sort of unpolished kind of feel to the family score particularly. But now we're talking about like way more interesting things. Like we're talking about Thumb of Golden, we're talking about the Bears, <laughs> we've moved on to like production design. Which, People are you know, pouring out of the back of the yeah. theater. <laughs> <laughs> this is our last Q&A. Nobody wants to hear me sing. <laughs> You know, um, yes, I can get into all that, but I'm not going to. I, I think I think what's what's interesting is and to um, is this film has elevated all of us tremendously. Not only in terms of you know obviously we've gotten Oscar nominations, which is you know super groovy, but we're we created a, a real family here, and I think that um, that also really has a lot to do with, of course, leadership. I, I mean. I did very good work on this um, because I cared so much about what you would think, you know, about what you would think, about what you would think, and Ben, and Hilda, and the whole team. Um, and so it was worth really digging in and trying to figure out how music could work in this. And I think everybody else, all of our department heads felt that same way and, um, and did their absolute best work. I mean, to very briefly answer your question, um, there are two major themes. There's the long theme, which is the bio, and there's the family theme, which is the and the thing about the family theme is it's it never really is in time. So when I said that I played in time at the ACLU benefit, mm. that was the miracle. I see. Um, and um, and there are always two instruments playing it, but they never ever play together, except in the pool scene where it's a bossa nova because finally the family looks like it's on the path to healing, at least in my mind. But so that was the kind of the fundamental DNA of, of the music score. And I think, you know, you see these seeds in in everything we've talked about in terms of the craft making of this film. Alright, so sorry, I've been so patient. Yeah. So I'm just gonna give you the mic. I'm yeah. trying to ask you a really good question. Yeah. Hey, first off, amazing film. Thank you all. And so I'm on the autism spectrum and I have a very vivid photographic memory. So over the past three and a half years I've been writing this personal narrative uh, feature length of mine. And in this film, um, the character is based off of me, he tries to reconnect with his babysitter from 20 years ago. But um, unlike him, she has no memory of him and thus ghosts him. So as like a catharsis, he writes a screenplay about them meeting up sometime down the road, kind of like a before trilogy kind of a deal. And the screenplay he writes gets heavily criticized, and he doesn't uh, take that very well. Uh, because at the end of the day, all he wants is just to see her again. So, um, in other words, this film is just an inspiration. So, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Cool, man. What's the question? That's what you was just offering, man. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate yeah, I just wanted to share it with you because it really resonates with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So, my last question is this. You know, so since the film, since the film, and all the way up until you know, now, 
uh, you have seen a whole lot of people who have a lot of questions. You've read a lot about the dome. But have you heard directly from like the months of the world who, or at least the months of our business, of this business, who came to you and said, that's my story, I have the same problem, they all want me to write the same sort of stereotypical black thing, and this movie really did so. Yeah, I think the really interesting thing that I have found is that people who are not, you know, necessarily like us have found themselves inside that narrative. Okay, think of that. Who, because I think at the end of the day, there's a universality in that we all want to be seen as we are. We all want to be our authentic selves, uh, to be as free as possible, creatively, intellectually. Um, psychologically and be received in that way. So that's what's been really moving for me, is that people from across backgrounds have said that they've related to his 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 struggles, not just the family dynamics, which you know, you know, the family is a family as insane as anybody else's family, you know. If you're born of a family you could recognize yourself somewhere inside that. But it's it's been it's been some of um, it's been really gratifying that that folks uh, yeah, have, have recognized whether they, uh, you know, even without being black men. To piggyback on what Jeffrey was saying about the support that the movie received from the studio, you know, from our distributor, that all began with audiences at Toronto, that yep. first reading we had at Toronto. And from there, it was college campuses and screens around town. and. Audiences when they would see this movie that we would talk to them afterwards, like every single person that we would talk to found something to connect, you know, in the family, in the satire. And this audience here tonight, I mean, we're at a point in this release where many probably could have watched this movie at home, you know. But you did. You came out here, you watched it with an audience. And the way it played in here tonight, I mean, I still get such a charge of just listening to an audience watch this movie. And this is like, I don't know about you guys, this is exactly how I picture this movie being received. This is exactly kind of what I hope for when we put this movie out. And, and, and I think at, at, at the essence, that's what the story, that's, that's what the story's about. It was just over in the, in the video store over here. And I'm like kind of an old school guy, you know? Like, Woo! Oh shit, Buster Keaton, oh wow. You know? And Buster Keaton was as racist as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the general is basically, you know, it's like, you know, celebration of the Confederacy. I love Buster Keaton, man. I love his stuff. I look at him and go, I mean, the narrative, of course, I understand. I mean, separate, but I look at him, man. I mean, there's probably no greater running gate in the history of cinema than Buster Keaton. Maybe the most, the most supremely talented athlete ever to put up here on the screen. The stuff that he does, the way that he, he uses his mask. I, you know, ah, oh, man. I got over it. Or I recognized, even with the limitations of his character as I understood it to be, Nonetheless, I found something inside of him that resonated with me. Maybe not necessarily as a citizen, but as an artist. We've, we've had to do that all our lives. I'm in the Batman. I love Batman, man, as a kid. You know? White dude, Bruce Wayne. What's the resistance for others finding themselves in our story? in this man, in his challenges. That's what the story is about. At its essence, it ain't that hard. If we, you know, we focus on, you know, as the human, uh, as the map of the human genome suggests, if we focus on what is, uh, uh, you know, 99.9% you know, of our, of our genome that's alike. We focus on, you know, less on the differences and more on, uh, on our similarities, and we can find ourselves, everybody can find ourselves in that kind of song.
This is the, uh, what's been a long winding road since September. What has been the biggest takeaway for you as we real here at the end yeah. of the <laughs> <laughs> Well, the question, I guess. The biggest takeaway for me. Um, I don't know, like, I, I feel like, uh, could you rephrase that? Uh, <laughs> is there, is there, is there, is there, I would ask you, is there, is there, is there, was, there, was there a point during this whole process with, you know, premieres and certainly these kind of sorts of conversations or, or meeting peers uh, that, that meant, meant more, meant really, really meant a lot to you? Yeah, I mean, look, the, I think that what Jeffrey is talking about is is what really means a lot to me is that this is, I think that one of the reasons the world is so polarized as it is right now is because we lost the ability to, to, to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. We've lost the ability to talk to each other. We've lost the ability to, to say like, yeah, you're different from me and maybe you believe some different things, but we share this sort of like commonality and where we can be okay with one another and, and, and talk and, and break bread and, and enjoy each other's company. Um, and so this movie was in some ways an experiment, right? It was, it, was, it was, can we talk about race and identity and sexuality and class and all these sort of third real issues that we don't like to talk to one another about? Um, can, we, can we talk about it in a way that's like really inviting to a lot of different people? I love New York and Los Angeles. I've spent my entire life in New York and Los Angeles, but I didn't want to make a movie just for people in New York and Los Angeles. I wanted to make a movie that, was, that, that a lot of different people could go into and maybe see something that resonated with them. And so we've now shown the movie to black audiences, to white audiences, to young people, to old people. We've shown it in France and England and Australia and Germany, and uh, we've shown it at the Hamptons Film Festival, and we've shown it at a black college in Atlanta, and every single kind of person, not every person, mind you, but every single kind of person has now come out of the movie and said that they found something that, that, that speaks to them. Yeah. And I think that that, to me, was is sort of like, it's the experiment gone right. It's like, you, we can do this, we can, we can you know, one of the beautiful things that Nico was talking about right now is, is see, you know, I think the AMC Nicole Kidman ad is fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It. I get it, it's campy, it's funny. But the thing that's weird about that ad is she's in an empty movie theater. Yeah. <laughs> and and check. That's not why you go to the movies, yeah. to sit in a big theater by yourself. Uh, you go there because you want a you want a communal experience. I think we should treat the theatrical experience like live music. Most of us have a way to listen to music at home, right? But the reason you go see a band is because you want to experience something with a group of people. You don't want to just listen to it at home. And I think that that's something that's really nice about movie theaters and concert halls and libraries and bookstores is that these. <coughs> These sort of cultural shared spaces are places where you come in and experience something with people who are different from you, and people who sort of who have different beliefs than you, opinions than you. You can sit in a room and sort of enjoy something together and find a, find a universal experience there. And so, I think that this movie is what has been nice is seeing all these different kinds of people come in and find something that that appeals to them and speaks to them. And I think that. There is a, you know, even, you know, people ask me, like, is, is do, do people, like, do, do people say, like, you know, do you experience this thing where sort of white people will come out of the movie and say something crazy to you about it? And it's like, and it's like, yeah, sometimes, but, but, I, but I think that, like, like, there was a, uh, there was a guy who came up, we had a screening in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and a guy, a guy came up to me, an older white gentleman in his seventies came up to me, and he said, uh, and he said, I just want to let you know, I think you'd be a very important voice for the black community. <laughs> 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 he, said, he said, I really think that you 